welcome back. We are continuing our journey through Three Below, uh, the second book in the Floor series by Patrick Carmen. And uh, the first three chapters were full of information. Uh, I think that's one reason it's one of my favorite books is that it really hits the ground running and gives you great adventure and great information uh, first chapter out. So in the first chapter, we learned that Leo and Remy's parents, Pilar and Clarence, both got married, got married to each other, and Merganser conveniently sends them on a week-long honeymoon out of the country so that the boys can complete a very important mission for him. And so we learn a little bit about that, and that ball gets rolling. Then, unfortunately, we find out that Miss Sparks is still very much in the picture, and she has not let things go, and she is working with somebody we only know as Mr. Carp uh, to try and obviously do something with the hotel and with Leo. So she is, she is definitely a problem that is coming back into this book as well. We also learn that Merganser has, whoops, uh, failed to pay the income or the property taxes to the state of New York uh, for the property that the Whippet sits on. And that's a pretty big deal. Parents know all about taxes and how much trouble that can get you into. Well, he told you, he told Leo that it is $700,000 that he owes. So Leo's a little bit worried about that. Uh, but he also knows that Merganser is sending him where he needs to go to get that. And the adventure is now beginning. The first step in his adventure, we learn in Chapter 3, is the Jungle Room, and that is a sub-basement of the Whippet, which Leo is totally amazed that even exists because he thought he knew everything about the hotel. And they find themselves in a sub-basement world that is a jungle room, complete with a tree and tree house and monkeys, except nothing, of course, is as it should be in the Whippet. And the tree is made of copper and rivets and all sorts of other non-organic materials materials and the monkeys are about the size of footballs and they have bright green eyes and bright orange tails. So obviously this is definitely classic uh, Whippet craziness going on. So let's see where we are headed now in chapter four and that is Trouble Brewing Up Above. I don't see why you had to bring the cat. It smells awful. Miss Sparks was in a foul mood as she walked up Fifth Avenue. It was hot and sticky, and Mr. Carp's cat really did put off an odor. He'd tried everything, mothballs, kitty baths, perfume, but Claudius was born to stink. Mr. Carp glanced down at the long-haired feline attached to a ragged leash. Claudius hated the leash and tried to cover for what appeared to be his only friend in the world. It's not my fault I can't afford a cat walker, Mr. Carp complained. Claudius spends all day inside a sweltering apartment. What do you expect? He was sweating under the rim of a wide sun hat as he tried, keep, tried to keep up with Miss Sparks, whose long stride was equal to two of his own. Miss Sparks crumpled her nose in disgust. I'll make Leo Fillmore keep it in the basement. It's the only way. But at silence, Miss Sparks said as they approached the vast grounds of the Whippet Hotel. Mr. Carp thought she looked positively mesmerized at the sight of the tall iron gate. She gazed into the openness and stood as still as a statue, her heart leaping at the wonder of what lay inside. She wasn't the only one who felt this way. It was common for passers-by to gawk at the property as if they'd stumbled onto the edge of the Grand Canyon. With skyscrapers all around its edges, the corner lot where the hotel sat was a gripping sight. Rolling pathways on green grass, giant bushes cut into the shapes of animals, a pond, all with the tiny miraculous hotel in the middle. We meet again, Miss Sparks said just above a whisper. The chill in her voice made Mr. Carp shiver even in the hot sun. Claudius tried to climb through one of the openings between the iron bars, but his head was too big. He, too, wanted to go inside. 
There were small birds and rodents to be chased in there. The cat could get used to a place like this. Might even stay outside all summer long, climbing the trees and sleeping in the warm sun by the pond. Let me do all the talking, Miss Sparks warned. Her tall hairdo was casting a shadow over Mr. Carp's face as he removed the silly hat and held it nervously in one of his grease-stained hands. Miss Sparks loved casting intimidating shadows with her hair. Do you understand? Miss Sparks asked, her crooked finger hovering over the call button that would, more than likely, lead to an open gate. She was worried about how Mr. Yancey would take to Mr. Carp and his awful cat. You're here to observe, Mr. Carp, to make it official. Nothing more. The less you talk, the better. Mr. Carp seethed inside. Who did she think she was, the Queen of England? But he was, to all appearances, a desperate man with no backbone. The whippet was the answer, and Miss Sparks was the way in. All he really wanted was for her to stop glaring at him. And so he nodded. Of course, this is your show. I'm only here to observe. Miss Sparks smiled an evil, sharp-toothed grin and pushed the iron, pushed the gate button, which buzzed annoyingly against her finger. Whippet Hotel, state your business, a voice crackled. In the absence of Pilar and Remy and Leo, Lillian Pompadour had taken a break. The front desk was being manned by Captain Rickenbacker. He had no idea what he was doing, and besides, he was playing checkers with Mr. Phipps. It's Miss Sparks. Let me in. I have business to discuss. Oh, uh, Captain Rickenbacker said. He looked at Mr. Phipps, not knowing what to do. I'm afraid you're, you're not allowed on the property, Mr. Phipps answered somewhat feebly. He had always been terrified of Miss Sparks when she'd been in charge of the hotel. Rickenbacker! And you, Phipps! She yelled into the speaker. People who had been hovering near the gate outside began moving away, uncomfortable with where this was going. I know it's you two in there. Don't deny it! No, no, we, we would never. Mr. Phipps trailed off. Captain Rickenbacker was already halfway to the stairs on the way to his room. Like most superheroes, he preferred playing pinball to being yelled at. Listen good, you two, Miss Sparks fumed. Open this gate and get Mr. Yancey. Tell him to meet me in the lobby. No one responded. Captain Rickenbacker had fled, and Mr. Phipps was seriously contemplating an escape of his own to the garden shed. Open the gate! Mr. Carp tugged on Claudius's mangled leash and started backing away quietly. Where do you think you're going? Miss Sparks said without taking her eyes off the hotel. She waited impatiently as Claudius sat down and licked the matted fur on his right foot. When the gate buzzed softly, Miss Sparks glowed with excitement. She knew that sound, knew what it meant. The gate was unlocked and she pushed it open, stepping onto the soft grass on the other side and fixing her narrow eyes on the mysterious hotel in the distance. Her whole body tingled. Just you wait, Merganser D. Whippet, she thought. Soon this will all be mine. Come, she said, waving Mr. Carp forward without looking at him. You'll like the room I've chosen for you much better than that cave you've been living in all these years. Mr. Carp looked back in the direction of the crummy neighborhood they'd walked from. He could run, even leave Claudius behind if he had to. But... For many complicated reasons, he did not run. His moment had come, and it would never come again. He turned and passed through the gate with Claudius leading the way. When he heard the iron clang behind him, he knew his fate was sealed. There would be no turning back now. And so it was that when Leo and Remy returned to the lobby, expecting to find Miss Pompadour, they found their old nemesis instead. Miss Sparks had taken up residence in precisely the same place from which she'd run the hotel with an iron fist for years, behind the registration desk. She was speaking to Mr. Yancey in a small voice like they were plotting. I knew we shouldn't have left Lillian Pompadour in charge, whispered Remy from their hiding place inside the duck elevator. 
They'd open the door just a crack, hoping Betty didn't quack and give them away. We leave for a few hours and she loses control of the hotel. Great. I'll admit it's a supersized catastrophe, Leo said. I'm fairly speechless. Leo thought of how disappointed his dad and Pilar and Merganzer would be. They'd left him in charge, and the one person who could ruin everything had found her way into the hotel in less than a day. It was a disaster. Leo was trying to think of a plan when he heard a noise. It was soft and fuzzy at the edge of his hearing. At first he thought it was Betty, snoring quietly, but when he looked at Remy, he knew it wasn't Betty. Remy had one of the easiest faces in the world to read. When he was hiding something, his dark eyebrows went up and the middle of his forehead crinkled. He'd heard the sound, too, and it had worried him. You didn't, Leo said. Leo pulled the small duck elevator door all the way shut and stared at his brother. Didn't do what? Remy asked, his eyebrows raising, his forehead crinkling. I don't know what you're talking about. What if she gets loose? Then what are we going to do? Leo asked. But she won't. I'll make sure, Remy said. He knew immediately he'd given himself away. Lupa peeked slowly out of Remy's red jacket pocket. The little monkey had woken up. She was cute when she woke up, groggy-eyed and yawning. It was impossible not to smile. I couldn't leave her there. Remy explained, petting the little monkey on her furry head. Lupa smiled up at him. We bonded. Just don't give her any flarts fizz. She'd blow our cover for sure. She'll be quiet, won't you? Remy said. But when Remy looked, the monkey had fallen back to sleep. See, no worries, Remy said. Leo wasn't so sure, but he gently pulled the doors open again. Betty got right up close to Lupa with her orange bill and stared curiously. She was acting motherly. It was what she did. Keep them both quiet, Leo said, putting his finger to his lips. It wasn't as if Remy could stop Betty from quacking or Lupa from making monkey sounds if they wanted to, but Leo still hoped for silence as he peered out into the lobby. It was hard to hear what they were saying, but he definitely heard some things that alarmed him. Mr. Yancey. Who's the new guy and what's with the cat? Ms. Sparks. Don't worry about them, just be ready. Mr. Yancey. I can't believe our luck, it's too perfect. Ms. Sparks. Where are those boys? They make me nervous. What are they saying? Remy whispered. He was getting tired of sitting in the cramped duck elevator and wanted to get out. Betty was looking at him like she might start quacking at any moment. They're in it together. Yancey and Miss Sparks, Leo explained. In what together? asked Remy. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to find out. Take Betty to the roof as fast as you can, and I'll meet you back here. I'm getting to the bottom of this. But... Remy wasn't sure it was a great idea to talk to Miss Sparks, but Leo was the official owner of the hotel. Technically, Remy was just the bellboy and the doorman, and in this particular situation, he was glad. It was good. It was a good moment not to be responsible. Leo quietly opened the duck elevator door and crept out into the hall next to the lobby. The door shut, and Remy, Lupa, and Betty were gone, slowly rising towards the roof. Leo put on his most confident face, straightened his whippet hotel maintenance overalls, and started for the lobby. He passed through toward the main doors as if he hadn't even noticed Miss Sparks or Mr. Yancey. Leo Fillmore, Miss Sparks said. Her voice was full of satisfaction like she was enjoying the fact that she'd appeared with bad news and it would surprise him to see her. Oh, hi, Miss Sparks, Leo said. Did you need something? Because I'm kind of busy right at the moment. Leo nodded in Mr. Yancey's direction. I hope your stay is going well, Mr. Yancey. We all always appreciate your visits. Miss Sparks looked 
quickly back and forth between Leo and Mr. Yancey as if she'd been momentarily stunned into silence. It didn't last long. I do have a rather pressing matter to discuss if it's not too much of a bother. She leaned over the desk in Leo's general direction as Mr. Yancey's phone rang. He used it as an excuse to leave the lobby, waving at Leo indifferently as he passed by. Come to think of it, Leo said, rubbing his chin as if he'd only just remembered an important fact. You're banned from the hotel grounds. Oh, that, Miss Sparks smiled. I don't think it's going to be a problem. You see, I've got permission. Permission from whom? Leo walked two steps closer to Miss Sparks. This was getting interesting and not in a good way. Miss Sparks held up a letter and began reading aloud. By the power vested in me, I do hereby appoint Ms. Lenora Sparks, the tax evasion specialist for the Whippet Hotel and its associated properties. Ms. Sparks is granted state authority to oversee this matter during the 24 hours after the signing of this letter. During that time, she is to observe in person the goings-on at said property. No items of value are to be removed. There was more, but Ms. Sparks stopped reading. She felt she'd read enough to make her point. It goes on, but it only gets worse. Leo reached into the front pocket of his overalls, feeling a little better. If this was about taxes, he'd already solved the problem. This is going to be easier than he thought. You need $700,000. I know all about it. Fortunately, I've already prepared the necessary payment. He had no intention of letting Miss Sparks touch the note or even get within two feet of it. Instead, he held it out so she could see it, then yanked it back and held it tight in his hand. It will be couriered directly to the proper authorities before the close of business today, Leo continued. He thought he'd done a fine job of sounding like he knew what he was doing. In reality, he didn't actually know who to give the note to, but he was sure Mr. Phipps would. Oh, my dear boy, said Miss Sparks, and this time she pretended to actually care. You've been misinformed. Let me guess. Merganzer left you holding the bag. You can't trust him. I tried to warn you. He's no good with numbers. Never has been. Always misplacing those pesky zeros. Leo was confused. I, I don't understand. How much do you think the Whippet Hotel owes? Miss Sparks came out from behind the desk holding the official looking piece of paper. Oh, I don't think. I know. It's a very serious matter. You're going to lose this hotel, Leo Fillmore. There's simply no doubt about it. She glanced at the contract once more, just to be sure. This hotel is seven million dollars behind on its de debt to the great state of New York. They've tried to reach you, but you have not answered their letters. This was not entirely true. The fact was, Miss Sparks had been intercepting the letters for many months. It was all part of her diabolical plan. Leo was in a daze. Seven million? Before he realized it, Miss Sparks had come nearer and snatched the $700,000 note out of his hand. This will do just fine as a down payment, but I'm afraid you're still 6300000 short. And did I mention that oh, I was given this authority 18 hours ago? Oh, maybe I didn't. You're down to six hours, Leo Fillmore. Better get cracking. She leaned in so that her nose nearly touched Leo's. Miss Sparks could be an extremely close talker when she felt in charge. I almost feel sorry for you, having to run this hotel on your own. You'll be better off without it. I don't believe you, Leo said, but he was shaking. Could she really take the hotel from him, just like that? She stood up straight and stared down at Leo. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. <coughs> it's true. Eighteen of your precious hours have already passed. You have six hours to come up with the rest, and we both know that's not going to happen. 
Leah started to back away, and then he had a thought. What's Mr. Yancey got to do with this? He asked. That's none of your business, she yelled. Miss Sparks pocketed the $700,000 note and brushed a duck feather off of her shoulder with a sour face. When I run this hotel, there will be no ducks. I won't be running a zoo with monkeys and birds and who knows what else. Miss Sparks didn't know how right she was. Stay close by in case I need you, she went on. And don't even think about leaving the hotel. I've assigned a guardian for you since your parents are gone and everyone else in this hotel is stark raving mad. A guardian? He's waiting for you in that hovel you call a room. He's not to let you out of his sight. It's one thing, the only thing he happens to be good at. He knows how to keep track of someone when the need arises. Leah didn't like the sound of a guardian one bit, especially one who had a weird super ability to keep an eye on people. It would greatly complicate things if he and Remy were to make it back under the hotel and find the gear Mergans are needed. He hadn't counted on all this trouble and wished his dad were here to help him. Remy hadn't returned in the duck waiter when Leo passed by, and he needed to get blocked from the basement room. The world felt like it was falling apart as he walked the steps down to the basement door. Ew, he said, crinkling his nose. He hadn't even gone inside, and he already he could smell Claudius. When he entered the basement, it reeked of wet cat fur. A small, unhappy-looking man was sitting on his bed holding a wadded-up cat leash in his hand. His skin was pale. He had a thick, drooping mustache, and there were large bags under his eyes. There was a frailness about him, like a soft summer breeze might knock him over. You must be the guardian, Leo said. Mr. Carp was staring at the call center wall where Daisy, the mechanical shark who delivered commands from the hotel guests, was resting quietly. Claudius doesn't like your shark, Mr. Carp said. It makes him nervous. Uh, if it's any consolation, Daisy makes me nervous, too. <laughs> you never know when she's going to wake up and deliver bad news. I see, Mr. Carp said. The cat meowed and rubbed up against Leah's leg, leaving a trail of fur behind on his overalls. I'm Mr. Carp, and this is Claudius, Mr. Carp said, pointing down at the cat. I see, Leo said, for he had no idea what else to say. She asked me to keep an eye on you and the other one. Remy, is it? You'll need to stay close by. Mm, what happens if we don't? Leo asked, uncertain how much power Mr. Carp actually had. Mr. Carp shrugged his shoulders as if he didn't really care. Will it be all right if I use the extra bunk while I'm visiting? Mr. Carp asked, looking at Clarence Fillmore's empty bed. I think this is what Miss Sparks had in mind. It's very nice down here, much nicer than my apartment. The basement was cozy for a maintenance man and his son, with its glugging water heater and hotel parts everywhere, but it was, by any reasonable standard, a crummy place for a normal person to live. Leo could only imagine what sort of place Mr. Carp rented. You can stay, just don't touch anything, Leo said. He felt sorry for Mr. Cart, but at the same time, he was feeling a little better about things. There was no way this guardian would be able to keep track of Leo and Remy. Things were looking up. Mr. Carp reclined on Leo's dad's bed, and Claudius jumped up next to him. This, Leo knew, meant he'd have to burn the bedding when the cat was gone. Remember, no leaving the hotel, Mr. Carp said, and then he closed his eyes. Leo didn't move for a full minute during which Mr. Cart began to snore, slot, n snore lightly, and Claudius coughed up a hairball that landed with a wet sound on the concrete floor. Psst! Remy had entered the basement and stood at the bottom of the stairs, holding his nose. Lupa was sitting on Remy's shoulder, digging a monkey finger into Remy's ear. Shh! Leo whispered as quietly as he could. He walked to his bed, got down on his knees, and fished his hand around in search of Blop. 
A moment later, he and Remy were standing together at the door, the little robot safely deposited in Remy's red jacket. That monkey's gonna be trouble, Leo said as he watched it run up and down the entire length of Remy's body. Yeah, she definitely woke up, Remy said. At least she's quiet. Lupa was an especially quiet monkey, but as Leo watched her leap off of Remy's shoulder and land on the floor, he could see it was going to be difficult to control her. Who's the smelly dude? Remy whispered as he picked up Lupa and put her back in his pocket. He had Blop, who was still sleeping in one pocket, and Lupa in the other. Leo rolled his eyes and started up the stairs, grabbing Remy by the arm and dragging him out of the room. In seconds, they were near the lobby, which Miss Sparks appeared to have left. Yeah, she's in my mom's old room, Remy said, unable to hide his loathing. I hope she's not pulling down all the decorations. Come on, I have an idea, Leo said. He ran through the lobby with Remy close behind. On the other side was the puzzle room, where piles of puzzle pieces lay on a long wooden table. There were 800,000 pieces. Mr. Phipps and Captain Rickenbacker were fond of trying to put it together, but had never gotten very far. I wish you could have seen it when Merganser made the pieces fly everywhere, Leo told Remy, smiling at the memory. That was something else. He took a black key card out of one of the side pockets of his maintenance overalls. He knew how to work the card so the piles of puzzle pieces would fly into the air and miraculously settle into the finished picture they were meant to be. Merganser had showed him how to do it. Only to be used when the time is right, Leo said out loud. Remember what I told you Merganser said about the puzzle being double-sided? Two sides, Remy said. I remember. After Merganser had left last time, Leo had taken the puzzle apart again, leaving it in piles on the table. Putting it back together was an almost impossible task without the black key card. Should I do it? Leo asked, his thumb hovering over the card, ready to swipe back and forth in the way that would send the pieces flying. He could put it together, build it so they could see the other side, a side they'd never seen before. I don't know. Does it seem like the right time? Remy asked. Leo couldn't be sure, but there was one thing he was sure of. He would know when the time was right. He put the key card away and shrugged. I don't think it's time, he said. Remy was having some trouble keeping Lupa in his pocket. He kept having to hold her head down while her arms snaked out in a desperate attempt to free herself. Just then, out of nowhere, the sound of a gigantic burp echoed through the lobby and into the puzzle room. It lasted a full ten seconds. Remy? Leo said, concern rising in his voice. Uh-huh. Where's that bottle of Flart's Fizz? Blop's mechanical eyes began to flutter. The little robot was waking up. He was sitting in the jacket pocket where the bottle had been. I left it in the duck elevator, Remy said. I thought it'd be safe in there. Lovely day, don't you think, Blop said, and Leo knew it was only the very beginning of a long-winded description of the sun, the clouds, and the mechanics of a lovely day. Remy and Leo ran back through the lobby, which was still empty, and arrived at the duck elevator. They were both hoping to find Captain Rickenbacker or Mr. Phipps, even the other long-stay tenants, Lily Ann Pompadour or Theodore Bump, would have been survivable. But they did not find any of those people trying desperately to open the second and last bottle of Flart's Fizz. There was, already there was already one empty bottle sitting on its side. You took two bottles? Leo asked, looking at Remy like he couldn't believe his brother had not only tricked Ingrid into giving him one, but had also taken an extra. It wasn't for me, Remy said, pleading to be understood. Honest, I thought we could each have, you know, one more big burp. Well, it was nice of you to think of me, but really, you shouldn't have. Remy knew Leo was right. It had felt wrong tricking Ingrid, even worse slipping an extra into his pocket when she wasn't looking. But seeing Jane Yancey with the last bottle of Flart's Fizz was too much. Put that down, you little thief! Remy yelled. 
Remy should have known better than to cross Jane Yancey. She was spectacularly spoiled, prone to hitting first and yelling right after. Get back, she yelled, hugging the last full bottle of Flart's Fizz to her chest as she crawled all the way inside the duck elevator and started pushing buttons. Leo calmly put his foot against the door so it wouldn't close and crouched down next to her, blocking the way out. Hi, Jane. How's it going? He asked. It was best to talk calmly to a cornered monster. You can't have it, she yelled. It's mine. I found it fair and square. You're not even allowed in there, you little creep, Remy said. He had gotten down on one knee, reaching in toward the bottle. Do you have any idea how rare those bottles are? And you already drank one without even asking. I'll tell my dad I will, she hissed. He'll be very interested in this stuff, whatever it is. Best burp ever. I know, right? Remy said. For a brief instant, he was overcome with excitement about the fizzy drink and wanted to talk about it and remember what it was like. And Remy, please, Leo said. Then he turned to Jane. We really do need you to give it back. How about a dollar? Jane was trying desperately to open the second bottle with her hand, but it wasn't a twist off. She laughed in Leo's face. Money meant nothing to Jane. She had all she needed and more, and then she put the end of the bottle in her mouth, which apparently was how she got the first one open. Get your disgusting mouth off my bottle of Florence Fizz, Remy yelled, lunging for the bottle. Jane Yancey screamed, and boy, could she wail when she wanted to. Leo could see the entire situation was rapidly spinning out of control. He didn't know what else to do. There was only one thing he could think of that might get her to stop screaming at the top of her lungs, ruining everything. How about a monkey? Leo said. Would you trade me the bottle for a monkey? Remy looked at Leo like he'd lost his marbles. He was so shocked it turned him speechless. His face, the color of a perfectly toasted marshmallow, turned two shades wider. You did not just say that. Remy finally said. Jan Yancey had gone silent, taking the end of the bottle out of her mouth. There was slobber all over the bottle cap, but it was still on. She hadn't managed to pry it off with her teeth. You have a monkey, she said. What do you take me for, a complete idiot? But there was doubt in her voice. It was, after all, the Whippet Hotel. It was full of surprises. Only seconds ago, she, pro she had produced the miracle burp of a lifetime. Maybe there was a monkey somewhere nearby. Blot began talking about monkeys. Lupa, who had been scared and therefore very quiet up to that point, peeked her head out from the other red jacket pocket. There are 264 different species of monkeys, Blop said, but Jane Yancey was suddenly and irreversibly mesmerized by Lupa. Blop went on and on about marmosets and night monkeys and howlers and spider monkeys. Put a sock in it, robot, Jane Yancey said, reaching toward Lupa. Lupa made a ridiculously cute gurgling sound and Jane Yancey cackled like a hyena. I must have it! I will have it! She said, laughing. The monkey for the bottle and your complete silence, Leo said. Remy could not believe his ears. Was Leo really giving Lupa away? It couldn't be. He was heartbroken. Jane Yancey looked at the bottle of Flart's Fizz and thought about how good it had tasted, better than anything she'd drunk in her life. And that burp, that glorious burp, it was pure magic. Still, it was a monkey. And not just any monkey. A tiny, goofy, silly monkey, small enough to put her doll clothes on. Here, she finally said. Take your stupid bottle of pop, but first give me the monkey. There's just one rule, Leo said, and you have to promise me you'll follow it. I hate rules, Jane said. It's just, well, this is a rare monkey. Super rare. So rare that there are certain people in this hotel who might want to take her from you. Miss Sparks? Jane Yancey asked. She was starting to come around. Yes, Miss Sparks. And 
Not to be too harsh, but I think maybe your dad too. I mean, he's really into money, right? He might want to sell Lupa if he finds out. Sell my monkey, Jane Yancey said. Her heart was starting to melt for the little monkey in Remy's pocket. But he can't sell my monkey. Exactly, Leah said. He heard someone in the lobby around the corner where he couldn't see and he brought down his voice. Which is why you need to keep the monkey in the flying farm room. No one goes in there, so it'll be safe, right? Right, she said. Jane Yancey smiled at Leo and made her best yucky face at Remy, both in the space of a second. She was lightning fast with facial expressions. Leo and Remy piled into the duck elevator next to Jane. It was a tight fit, and as they climbed the floors up to the flying farm room, Remy reluctantly took Lupa Lupa out of his pocket. Her name is Lupa, Remy said. Be nice to her, okay? I'm the nicest person I know, fatso. Remy grabbed the bottle of Flart's Fizz and wanted to open it, guzzle it, and mega burp in Jane Yancey's face. He was barely overweight to begin with, like 20 pounds, and he'd actually lost a few since he'd last seen this little jerk sitting in front of him. But he could see that Leo had been right. Jane Yancey melted into a gross puddle of girly sweetness the second Lupa landed in her lap. There was no way Jane Yancey would let anyone near Lupa. Lupa tried to squirm feet free, but Jane held the little monkey close and cooed at it, which calmed Lupa down. Remember, only the flying farm room, Leo said. It's not safe anywhere else. No problem, Jane said. Lupa curled up in her lap and made soft monkey sounds, which sent Jane into a tizzy fit of giggles. When they arrived at the floor of the flying farm room, Leo and Remy walked her to the door and unlocked it. I'll let you keep the key card, but only if you promise not to let her out. And you have to feed her. You know, monkey food. Leo looked at Remy, who shrugged. Neither of them knew what to feed a monkey. I'll figure it out, Jane Yancey said. And just like that, she snatched up the key card, passed through the door, and slammed it in their faces. You do have another key card for that room, right? Remy asked because eventually we'll need to rescue my monkey from the clutches of that evil princess. As if on cue, both boys heard Jane Yancey yell from the other side of the door, Rip off! This monkey has no tail! Come on, let's get out of here fast, Leo said. They'd picked up Blop and, Blop and dropped off a hyper monkey, but there was still work to be done before their fateful encounter with Dr. Flart. They had to find out where to put the zip rope, otherwise known as Lupa's tail. And they'd need to do it while avoiding Mr. Carp and Ms. Sparks and finding $6,300,000. Chapter 5. An Isle of Penguins, a Boy Named Twist, Robinson Crusoe. Leo and Remy stood in the Whippet Library. It was on the hidden 13th floor, and there was only one way of getting there, the silver key card. Leo kept this card, which unlocked every door in the hotel, on a chain around his neck. It was the only silver card in existence, so he was sure Ms. Sparks would have loved to get her hands on it. Quite a ride, Remy said. His hair was standing on end and his stomach didn't feel so good. It's the only way in, Leo said. The silver key card unlocked a panel in the duck elevator, which revealed four buttons that had to be pushed in just the right order. Doing it right sent the duck elevator on a wild journey back and forth and up and down, ending at the 13th floor. Leo left the one and only fuse they had in their possession in the duck elevator for safekeeping. He knew things might get wacky in the library, and he didn't want to risk breaking it. What did he say again? Remy asked. Penguin twisting desert island or something like that? Your brain works in mysterious ways, Leo said, and it was true. Remy wasn't right, but he was kind of close. Leo corrected him. An Isle of Penguins, a boy named Twist, 
and Robinson Crusoe. Well, that's what I said, Remy concluded seriously. And he had only in not so many words. You're right about one thing. Robinson Crusoe is about a guy stranded on a desert island. Twist must be Oliver Twist. The penguin has me stumped. They spent the next few minutes looking through Merganser's vast collection of books. The volumes ran floor to ceiling on 20 feet tall shelves, snaking in every direction. And Remy insisted on being the one to ride the ladder while Leo pushed it. To the left, another few feet, Remy said as they searched for the Charles Dickens section. Leo pushed the ladder, which rolled on wheels connected to the floor and ceiling until Remy told him to stop. Got it, Remy said, pulling out the book. He stood on the ladder waiting for something to happen, but nothing did. As I suspected, Leo said, that's the second book we're supposed to find, not the first. They didn't know what the peng penguin book was, so they searched for Robinson Crusoe, even though it wasn't the first book either. Got it, Remy yelled. Leo thought he heard a familiar sound behind him, but he wasn't sure. Was that coming down? Remy yelled before Leo could finish. Remy liked the idea of sliding down the ladder like it was a fire station pole. He let his feet flop to the sides and slid down with only his hands. It turned out that actually using a ladder like a sliding pole was not as fun as the idea of doing it. Within the first five feet, his hands were on fire the friction burning hot against his skin like a supercharged rug burn. He tried to get his feet back on the rungs, which sent his legs flying wildly in every direction, like hail ricocheting against pavement. He landed hard, barely missing Leo, but somehow managed only a few scrapes and bruises. Let's hope the penguin is closer to the ground, Leo said. And also, I'm going up this time. You're scaring me. Leo started climbing the narrow ladder for a look around and quickly found himself 20 rungs up. Let's check the card catalog. Maybe it will help, Remy yelled with a snap of his fingers. Merganser D. Whippet wasn't exactly anti-technology, but he did like to have everything written down in case whatever computer he was using went on the fritz. With the Lippet Whippet Library, he always kept the entire collection in a card catalog system organized in various ways. There were at least three cards for every book, because he found that sometimes he was searching for a writer, sometimes a title, and sometimes a subject. Searching through authors was no help at all, so Remy knew pretty quickly that the writer's name was not Penguin. Searching through the subject revealed a healthy selection of titles having to do with penguin life, but he came up empty-handed after searching through them all for something about an isle of penguins. This is taking a long time, Leo yelled down, frustrated and hungry. They hadn't eaten all day. Maybe we should take a break and get some animal crackers. Normally, this would have been an immediately agreeable idea for Remy, but he'd started searching through the title card catalog and he finally hit pay dirt. Penguin Island, Remy shouted, holding up the card and waving it around like he'd won the lottery. I found it. Leo started climbing down, but halfway to the bottom, Remy began pushing the ladder so fast that Leo lost his grip with one hand and spiraled out into the air. It's by a French guy named France, Remy said, lurching to a stop where he thought the book might be. Remy had discovered that the writer named France was French because Merganser D. Whippet had noted this fact on the card. A very Merganser thing to do. Leo spun back around and banged his knees on a ladder rung, but at least he had both hands attached again. He was safe for the moment. Did you not hear me screaming up here? Leo yelled. I know, right? I'm excited too, Remy called up. Let me know the next time you're going to push... Let me know when you're going to push the ladder that hard next time, will you? Leo asked. He was going to tell Remy about nearly falling to his death, but Remy spooked easily. Better to just let it pass. 
By the looks of this number, Penguin Island is way up there near the ceiling, Remy said. Should be right here, straight up. Leo looked up. It was the tallest section of the library, right next to the pond on the roof, which had the most amazing glass bottom. He could see the ducks swimming around in the mottled late afternoon sunlight. Are you sure? Leo asked. He didn't really want to go all the way up there with Remy holding the ladder. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, like 70% sure. Tell me if you're going to move the ladder, okay? Leo pleaded. Check, Remy said and gave a salute. I can verify the information, Blop said. He'd gotten a look at the card, which Remy had shoved in his jacket pocket. Mr. Whippet and I spent many hours creating the card system. Very complicated business. Lots of logic involved. You see, the way it works is you start with the writer and cross-reference the subject with the title. Leo completely tuned out Blop's small mechanical voice as it echoed through the grand library space. He climbed, fast and with purpose, until his head was nearly touching the ceiling. He could tell by looking back and forth that he was very near the center of the room. When he looked at Remy, he realized how high he was and it took his breath away. Grab the book, Remy said. The sooner we get this done, the sooner we can get back in the elevator. Leo found the spine for Penguin Island. The author was on the spine too, France. Pulling out the book, Leo hoped there wouldn't be some sort of explosion that would knock him off the ladder, but he didn't need to worry. Absolutely nothing happened. This is ridiculous, Leo said, irritated with Merganser's crazy way of hiding things. But peering into the space where the book had been, Leo saw another book hidden in the shadows. He pulled out four or five books on each side and dropped them to the floor. It rained books and Leo felt bad. Not for Remy, who was unsuccessfully dodging about half of them, but because the books were being damaged on the way down. Try to catch them, Leo yelled, but he wasn't really paying attention to what was happening down below. He was laser focused on the copy of Oliver Twist that was standing alone between two slabs of marble. It was a hardback edition, thick and old. I think I'm figuring it out, Leo called to Remy. Great, maybe warn me if you're going to keep throwing books. A guy wants to be prepared but there were no more books to throw. Leo pulled out the copy of Oliver Twist and set it gently in the space he'd created by removing other less important books. And there it was, all alone, deep in the dark shadow of the library, a single book stood hidden. I think I found it, Leo said. Leo took a deep breath and reached back into the darkness it crossed his mind that there might be spiders or mice or rats in the deepest part of an old library, and he hadn't actually seen what the book was. It was too dark for that. Still, he gathered his courage, reached all the way in up to his shoulder, and took the spine in his hand. And then he pulled. I got it! It's the right book! Leo yelled down. It's Robinson Crusoe! Leo waited for something to happen, but nothing did. He began to think maybe he was supposed to do something with the book and started flipping through the pages. Um, Leo? Remy said. Ah, you've set things in motion. Very exciting, Blop said. And then he went on about the mechanics of how the shelves were moving. Unfortunately for Leo, he wasn't really listening to Blop, and Remy was nearly speechless. This book is past due, Leo said, shaking his head and wondering why it was hidden in a secret place. He had one arm hooked through the ladder as he came to the last page. <sighs> it's not even Merganser's book. He, he checked it out from the Brooklyn Public Library 23 years ago and never returned it. Leo, Remy said, finally getting his voice back. Hold on! Leo closed the book and looked down, wondering what the problem was. But before he could get a good look, Remy shoved the ladder as hard as he could. This time, Leo couldn't hold on. He was falling, 
and the only thing that was going to save him were the shelves of books that were flying past. Leo dropped the copy of Robinson Crusoe and reached out, grabbing the ledge of a shelf full of books about polar bears, whales, and sea creatures. The impact stretched Leo's arms to the breaking point, then he let go and caught the next ledge down. He was going slower the second time and held firm. Get out of the way, Leo, Remy shouted. Leo looked down and saw his legs hanging limply in the air. He was losing his grip, but that wasn't the worst part of his predicament. The shelves below him were spinning like revolving doors. Ten feet high sections starting at the floor were whirling in circles as if stuck to a pole in a furious wind. And the spinning sections of bookshelves were getting closer. Leo was nearly 40 feet in the air, but two 10 feet high sections were already spinning and the section right below him was starting to move. He didn't have much time before the section of self shelf he was hanging from would start spinning too. Try to climb down, Remy yelled, but the ladder had been pushed off to the side and the spinning shelves weren't going to let it back in. But how? Leo yelled. He glanced down as three of his four fingers on each hand pulled away. Oh, I can time this just right, Leo said to himself. I can do it. The shelf Leo was holding on began to move, and as it did, Leo let go with it, let go with his last fingers. He landed with a thud on the turning shelf below and slid off to the side, nearly falling all the way to the hard floor of the library. Just as he was about to be knocked in the head by the shelf above, he dropped once more, landing on the top edge of the second highest spinning shelf. You're doing it, Remy said, clapping his hands together in excitement. I know, right? Leo smiled, but he should have been watching while he was celebrating. The shelf above him, above him came around and knocked him off his feet. He tumbled down, landed hard on the first spinning shelf, then dropped the final ten feet like a bag of flour, knocking Remy over. Both boys crawled out of the way as Blot began talking about the book Leo had found. First book in the Whippet Library, Robinson Crusoe, Blop said. Leo was just happy to be alive, and Remy was extremely glad his brother and best friend was okay. Second book, Oliver Twist. Third book, let me guess, Remy said, Penguin Island. Third book, Penguin Island. Fourth book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Fifth book, can you set him on the floor while we check this out, Leo asked. There are thousands of books in here. He could be at this a while. Remy nodded his agreement and set Blop on the floor where he, where he happily recited the names and the order of the books that had become part of the collection of the Whippet Library. I think we'll need to be careful, Remy said. Do you have the zip rope? Leo patted his hand on one of the side pockets of his maintenance overalls. Got it. All the shelves were still spinning, including the bottom one, but not so fast that they couldn't slip through as the opening appeared. Once they reached the other side, they found stairs leading down into darkness. I don't understand this hotel at all, Leo said. There must be a hidden floor here no one knows about. At the bottom of the stairs, the boys stopped abruptly, for they had stumbled onto something that looked extremely fragile. Don't move, Leo said. Dude, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, Remy said which was saying a lot, given all the rooms in the Whippet Hotel. We have to make it go. On the vast floor before them were thousands upon thousands of dominoes. They wound all through the space, up and down long ramps, through silver rings, under bridges of stone. In the very center of the room sat a safe, and on top of the safe, a golden duck. He does like himself a good duck, Remy observed. I wonder how it all works, Leo said. Easy, you just push one over and the whole thing tumbles. Without asking Leo, Remy touched the toe of his shiny doorman shoe to the edge of the very closest domino. No, don't, Leo warned, covering his eyes at the thought of having to set all the dominoes back up again if it didn't work. Hey, Remy said, touching the first domino again. It's not moving. Remy tapped the domino a little harder, and he kicked it. 
Then he jumped on top of a whole bunch of standing dominoes. None of them moved. Interesting, Leo observed, kneeling down for a closer look. They're metal, and so is the floor. <laughs> Heaviest dominoes I ever saw, Remy said. But Leo thought he knew the truth. It's like the puzzle downstairs. The floor is a giant magnet holding them all perfectly still. <laughs> Merganser is awesome, Remy said, shaking his head at such a wacky invention. They both traveled through the maze of dominoes and stood in front of the safe, which had a handle of weathered wood. Leo tried opening it, but it was shut tight and there was no dial or lock. He also noticed a strange humming sound in the air, like the sound of many bees high in a tree. Has to be the dominoes, Leo said. There must be a way to make them move. Number 87, the cat in the hat. Blob said, a personal favorite. The little robot had rolled up to the edge of the stairs. He was looking down at them with his bright mechanical eyes. Blob, Leo called, walking back toward the stairs and leaving Remy to stare at the golden duck. How do you, do you know how to make the dominoes move? Number 88, Blob said, but then he stopped having been given a direct, different directive. Why, yes, I do know how to make the dominoes move. It's fun to watch. Would you like to move them? I would, Leo said. Pull the duck's leg. Leo looked back at Remy, who already had his hand on the narrow leg of the golden duck. Like this? Remy asked, and he pulled. The leg came up, and the humming sound disappeared. Cool, Remy said. He backed up two steps, letting go of the leg, and accidentally touched the heel of his shoe against a random metal domino. It fell over, knocking down other dominoes in their turn. Must be done in the right order, or the emergency lock will engage, Blop said. Only Merganser can open it if that happens. The dominoes were falling fast, racing around the room with incredible speed. We have to stop it before it's too late, Leo cried. Remy took this to mean that he should dive onto the moving dominoes and try to stop them, which was funny to watch, but not very helpful. He dove from section to section, trying to bring things to a halt, but dominoes kept falling all around him. Blop, Leo said, staring up at the robot at the top of the stairs. Can we stop it? Of course you can. God, can you tell me how? Leo asked in his calmest voice. He wanted to freak out, but he knew Blop responded best to direct and simple commands. Push the duck's leg back down. This time it was Leo running through the room, knocking down dominoes with almost every step he took. By the time he reached the golden duck, about 90% of all the dominoes had fallen. He pushed the golden leg back down and heard the humming sound return. And like magic, every domino jumped back to its starting position all standing in attention like thousands of rectangular army men. Whew, Remy said. That was a close call. Leo stayed where he was and sent Remy back to the stairs where he waited for Leo to pull the golden duck leg up again. When he did, Remy tapped the first domino. Leo and Remy got to watch as every last one fell in perfect order, up ramps, under bridges, through rings that had lit up with fire. Near the end, the dominoes toppled up a long ramp that ended above the safe. The last domino fell, landing directly on the duck. There was a slot on the golden duck's back, and the domino fit perfectly inside. Then the golden duck laid a golden egg, which dropped through a hole on top of the safe. It's moving, Remy said, pointing to the duck. The golden duck began to rise into the air on a long, thin pole, up it went, past the ceiling, to places Leo and Remy couldn't see. I think it's on the roof, Leo said, but he couldn't be sure. He grabbed the wooden handle in front of him and opened Merganser de Whip it safe. The door was heavy as iron, but it glided on solid brass hinges without a sound. By the time Leo had the safe open, Remy was standing next to him. They both peered in at once. There's the egg, Leo said. The golden egg was perched on a stem that looked like a long silver golf tee. It had landed perfectly. In the center of the safe was a round circle painted in white with a word in the middle. Fizz. <coughs> Better put the bottle there, Leo said. 
Remy took the last bottle of Clark's Fizz out of his red jacket pocket <coughs> and looked longingly at it one last time. It was orange or brown or sort of yellow inside. He couldn't say. Flart's fizz was funny like that. A color that was not a color, with the best kind of surprise inside. He knows how to hit me where it hurts, Remy said, but he knew it was for the best. It wasn't his bottle of Flart's fizz. Remy set the bottle in its place. This is going really well, don't you think? Leah thought about everything they'd already been through in such a short time, how dangerous it had been, and of Miss Sparks lurking inside his beloved hotel. Sure, Remy, he said. It's going swell. I just hope the second half is easier than the first. Tch, don't count on it, Remy said. Along one side of the safe was a collection of crumbled manila envelopes. The envelopes had the appearance of having been well used, with paint splatters and small notations and schematic drawings and weathered pencil everywhere on their surface. Remy pulled one out and found that it had a red wax seal keeping it shut, just like the envelope they'd been given. The seal had a letter W pressed into it. Looks official, Leo said. And there are dozens of them. I wonder what's inside. Remy turned the envelope over and gasped. No way. There were words written there in a wispy, mergans or D-Whippet style. Master plans, the pinball machine. Leo beamed as he started pulling out envelopes. Each one was crumpled and worn at the edges, full with the sense of having been on location when the real work was happening. Remy, Leo whispered. These are the master plans. It's amazing. Leo read two. Master program and schematic, blop. Plan model, the double helix. The double helix, Leo yelled. I love the double helix. The double helix was a secret elevator that ran up the middle of the Whippet Hotel, but really, it was more like the best thrill ride ever. Fast, treacherous, spinning, twisting. Remy read two more. Master plan, the flying farm room, the realm of gears. And this particular envelope had another note scratched on it, a note that had been written more recently. Only, open only when traveling in the realm of gears. Whoa, Leo, Remy whispered. The realm of gears. Isn't that one of the places Ingrid said something about? I think you're right, Leo agreed. It sounds like there are instructions inside. But remember what she said. If we needed over a million, we'd have to go there. So we're fine. There's no reason to take the envelope, I guess. Actually, Leo said, I didn't want to worry you, but uh, yeah, we're in some trouble. She wants seven million, not 700,000. Ouch, Remy said. I don't think selling my comics will get us that far, or my four bucks. Both boys thought about what the gears might be like and whether or not the route would be dangerous. They put all the other envelopes away, but kept the one about the realm of gears. He would have wanted us to have it, right? Remy said, looking up at Leo for guidance. Leo wasn't older, not really, not enough to matter. But he had always seemed like a barely bigger brother, someone he could trust when he didn't know the answer to a tough problem. He's forgetful for sure, Leo said. Maybe he meant to say we should take it. He, did, he didn't say not to. That was all the convincing Remy needed. He liked the idea of having some insurance in case things went sideways underground. Folding the envelope the long way, Remy stuffed it inside his jacket pocket for safekeeping. They asked Blop how to close the safe, and the little robot explained about the golden egg, how to put it back into the golden duck, and how to close the safe again so it would open when they came back. But we'd have to go to the roof to do that, Leo said. That duck is all the way up there now, at the end of this pole. <laughs> we don't have time for that. Now, not with Miss Sparks threatening to auction off the hotel in about five hours. They'd made a 
little bit of a mess, but there was no time to pick up all the fallen books and put everything back the way it was. In fact, there was no time to stop the shelves from turning, even though Blop was determined to tell them the complicated way in which it should be done. Instead, they ran through the Whippet Library, newly excited by the places they would need to explore in order to finish what they'd started. The first thing Leo noticed when he returned to the duck, eleva duck elevator was the item that was no longer there. And here we go with chapter six. The trap door closes. It's gone, Leo said. What's gone? Remy asked. The fuse. And it's the only one we have. We can't get back under the hotel without it. Did you hear that? Remy asked. Hear what? Leo asked back. Someone had used the trap door on top of the duck elevator and was still sitting up there. Remy was sure of it. He pointed to the ceiling of the small space. Put Blop away before he starts talking, Leo whispered in his smallest voice. Who's up there? Remy shouted without thinking, blowing their cover as Leo slapped his forehead in frustration. Perfect, Leo said. But in a way, he was glad. They needed the fuse, and the only way to, the only they, the only way they were going to get it was to first find out who'd taken it. At least Remy followed Leo's instructions about the blob. There was only one sure way to make the robot go quiet: put him upside down in Remy's red jacket pocket. It was like putting him to sleep. Something even Remy did once in a while for a break from the never-ending monotony of Blop's voice. If that's you, Jane Yancey, you're in big trouble, Run, Remy said once Blop was safely upside down in his pocket. Lupa better not be up there. She could get loose in an elevator shaft. Leo thought Remy had said too much. What if it wasn't Jane Yancey? But he let it pass and gently knocked on the trap door. We know you're up there, Leo said. You stole our fuse. The door, Leo knew, snapped shut from the inside. A person could get trapped up there by accident if he or she didn't know the proper way to open it. Leo looked at Remy with a look that said, be ready to run, and then he unlatched the trap door and pushed it up a few inches. At first, there was no one, just a long silence as Leo guided the door up another inch or two. Then four dirty, knuckled fingers appeared over the edge of the door, pulling it all the way open. I don't think it's Jane Yancey, Remy whispered. A second hand drifted out above the opening, holding the missing fuse. Looking for something? A voice asked. Oh, no, Leo said. What? Remy responded, because he didn't recognize the voice, though he'd heard it in the basement once before from around a corner. Who is it? Why, it's me, Mr. Carp, of course. Who are you expecting, that Rickenbacker character? He's too big to fit up here. Why are you hiding on top of my duck elevator? Leo asked. Mr. Carp's head appeared over the edge of the door. His glasses had slid down to the end of his nose, making him look older than he was. I told you already. I'm supposed to keep an eye on you, making sure you don't try to leave or do anything shifty. It's my job. And you stowed away up there while we were in the puzzle room? Leo asked. He was trying to keep Mr. Carp busy while he thought of a plan. Yes, well, I didn't mean to get stuck up here. Only to do my job, you see. Yeah, we see what you mean, Leo said. You're serious about your job. You'll find I'm impossible to shake, Mr. Carp said proudly. Like a bad cold or a wad of gum on your shoe. It's a gift. Leo thought Mr. Carp was more like a bumbling inspector than a serious force to be reckoned with, but Leo was also smart enough to know that looks could be deceiving. How did you get our fuse? Leo asked. You were trapped up there. Not at first. That unfortunate part came later, Mr. Carp said. He explained that he'd put a popsicle stick in the trap door so it would stay open, and when they'd left the elevator, he'd opened it and reached down, taking the fuse. The only problem is he'd knocked the stick away when pulling up the fuse. Before I knew it, 
Mr. Carp said. The trap door was shut and I was up here. Can we have our fuse back? Leo asked. We're not going to leave the hotel, promise. What's behind the books? Mr. Carp asked. His tone changed slightly, as if he were no longer bumbling along, but instead had struck upon something important he could benefit from. Hot dogs, Remy said, and popcorn. It's just silly stuff like that. You know, Mergans are always with the strange rooms. You take me for a fool, Mr. Carp said somberly. I could tell important people about this, you know. I could tell Miss Sparks, and she'd come right up here and look for herself. You don't want that to happen, do you, Leo Fillmore? Just tell me what's in there. I'll tell you if you give me the fuse, Leo said. Mr. Carp seemed to consider the option, but he didn't answer right away. Nice mustache, Remy observed. He had seen it from a distance in the basement and had wanted to say something about it. Remy dreamed of growing a thick mustache someday. It takes many years, Mr. Carp said proudly. A mustache like this, you'll get there one day. You think so? Oh, with a head of hair like that, I know so. Sometimes Remy was smarter than Leo realized. Mr. Carp's only friend, as far as Leo could tell, was a stinky cat. Remy's compliment was a rare treat for a man like Mr. Carp. So a trade then? The fuse for the information? Promise? Mr. Carp asked. His intentions were impossible to read, but Leo nodded just the same. They were completely stuck without the fuse. Mr. Cop, Mr. Carp tossed down the fuse, and Leo caught it, carefully handing it to Remy with a wink. In the space of two seconds, Leo had the rainbow key card out of a pocket, sliding along the corner of the duck elevator, sending the walls into a dancing display of colors as Mr. Carp look on, looked on in wonder. That's quite a trick, he said, inching his way around the edge of the trap door for a better look. Leo secretly handed Remy the beaker key card, the one they'd gotten from Ingrid, just as the wall of the elevator slid away. What was that? Mr. Carp asked, for he couldn't see the wall in question from his perch. And what about the room behind the bookshelves? What's back there? You promised to tell. Remy was on his belly in a flash, pulling out the old fuse and inserting the new one. It's a room full of dominoes, Leo said. Thousands of them, all set up to be knocked down. Oh, I do love dominoes, Mr. Carp said, smiling for an instant. But why? What are they for? Remy looked up at Leo, and Leo nodded. Better hold on to the cable, Mr. Carp, Leo said. Mr. Carp looked as though he had a mind to scold the boys further until they spilled the beans about what was really hidden in the room, but he didn't get the chance. Suddenly, without warning, the duck elevator was moving fast. I tried to warn you, Leo shouted. Remy had inserted the beaker card. He'd gotten out of the way just in time as the wall slid back into place and the elevator had dropped like a piano out a window. Hold on, Mr. Carp, Remy screamed. Hold on. But the trap door slammed shut as the duck elevator plummeted past the lobby, the basement, the jungle room. They could hear him up there screaming, so at least he had held onto the cable and wasn't free falling down the elevator shaft. I'm not sure we should have left him up there, Remy said. At least now we know where he is, Leo said as the duck elevator started to slow down. And he can't get out. Heh, <laughs> actually, you're right, Remy said. <laughs> That's perfect. As the elevator came to an abrupt stop, they heard Mr. Carp yelling for them to let him out. It was a muffled cry for help, but it sounded like he was unharmed. Don't worry, Mr. Carp, Remy yelled at the ceiling. Technically, we're still in the hotel. You're doing a great job. Leo and Remy smiled at each other. They even giggled a little bit. Everything was going to be just fine. Shall we open the elevator doors and see what Dr. Flart's dungeon looks like? Leo whispered. He thought it. Oh, shall we open the elevator doors and see what Dr. Flart's dungeon looks like? Leo whispered. He thought it best to keep Mr. Carp in the dark about where they really were, but Remy was too excited for that kind of nonsense. Flart says, here we come, he yelled, opening the elevator door with a huge grin on his face. There was a muffled call from above that sounded to Leo like, what's 
Fenart's Fliz. He laughed, thinking of the tremendous adventure they were on. But then the doors were open, and he was looking into Dr. Flart's dungeon. All the color ran out of his face. His jaw went slack. This might not be as much fun as we thought, he heard Remy say. I think you're right, Leo answered. And then they walked out into the first dungeon either of them had ever been in.